Go to this church. It had the prettiest tall double doors, 10, maybe 11 feet tall. That's big. And they were carved, too. They were probably brass. They had carvings of the angels and some of the great saints of the church. And I always loved those doors because when I could open those doors, I would enter into this magnificent old sanctuary, a place where I had gone many times for prayer and for worship. And so I wanted to show it to a couple of my friends that had come over from the city to visit. When you live at Bay St. Louis and you say the city, what is that? Somebody know? New Orleans, right. And so some of the people that come over from the city, I said, let me show you how beautiful the church is. And so we got out of the car, we walked up to the doors, and they were locked as locked could be. And I shook the doors because I'm not used to the doors being locked, and I said, these doors should be open. But they were not open. Neither were the doors on the side, nor was anyone there, and so we looked at the church from the outside. Doors matter. Doors are important. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. A door is a way in. A door is an opportunity for that which we knew about out there, the outside of our reality, to begin the process of becoming the inside of our reality. If anyone hear my voice and will open the door, what you and I can do is open the door of our hearts. That might not be fancy, but trust me when I say to you, it's the bottom line. Art, one of our guys in the church, was talking to the men's group this morning. And he said, so much life and so much love is lived without passion. We need to feel and we need to feel deeply about some of those things which matter the most to us. And there's nothing wrong with deep feeling. It's got to be balanced, of course. Paul Tillich, the great theologian, comes and talks to a group of graduates at one of the major schools at one of the great Eastern schools, and people say, this great man, what in the world is he going to say? This famous religion teacher and theologian and philosopher of religion, what in the world could he say that would make any difference? And Paul Tillich gets up there after a grand introduction, looks at the students for a long time, and says, be open. Let God... Go serve. Amen. That'll do. And if you and I will just open ourselves to the point that we would allow Christ in, we would begin to have a whole new set of feelings about people and circumstances. And a whole new set of feelings about people and circumstances that come from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit instead of the declarations of the world out there. That's not something just to think about. That's something to feel and allow. Lord Jesus, I want you in. It makes me think of the little kid that wanted to take communion and his mom and daddy didn't think that he was old enough. And finally they said, but you don't understand. He said, yes, I understand completely. I want the Jesus out there to be the Jesus in here. And I want it right now. How about that? Well, if that won't get it, what will? There'll be many doors that'll be closed to us and locked. But the door that makes the most difference, the door that moves from time into time without limit, the door that moves from here to there, the, the door that moves from no God to the fullness of God, the door that moves from the presence of Jesus is the door that we must open. He will not break down. He will not shout down. He will not make you. If anyone hear my voice and will open the door, if you will let me in, I will come. Second, not only will he come into your heart, but he'll also come into your every day. I want to go sit at the table with you. It's interesting. I don't know a great deal about the houses in those days and times. I don't suppose they were big. Except for the rich folks, I don't suppose they were fancy. But I will bet you anything that you came into a little place that you met and you had to walk through a couple of rooms to get to the kitchen because the kitchen was the place for intimacy. And when someone was given hospitality, it was one thing to say, you can come in my door. But when someone said, will you sit at the table with me? Will you have a meal with me? That was intimate. It was holy intimacy, but it was intimate. And Jesus said, I want to come in and I'd like to have supper. Do you mind? Moselle Lewis, who's a wonderful little lady out at Spring Ridge Church, was a member of the congregation when I served as their student pastor. Trust me when I tell you that congregations that receive student pastors should all get medals from the government or from God or from somebody, you know. 
for putting up with us because of how little we knew. But one night I knocked on Moselle's door and I said, honey, we're hungry. Have you got anything to eat? And she said, who is we? And I said, it's just me and four guys from Millsaps. They had come out for the evening service to sing. And she said, come on in. And she had about this much roast beef. Maybe about that thick, about that much roast beef, you know, about two inches. And, but she had a lot of gravy and she had a lot of bread. And she said, well, bread and gravy do. And we said, uh, yeah. And we sat down. And I know you know what I'm going to say because we had a feast. We had a feast. It wasn't just the amount of roast, which was limited. It was the amount of love, which was unlimited. It was the glad welcome. It was the sit at my table. It was talk about what's going on. It was about yielding my protective personality to a kind of intimacy and interaction with people that can ultimately be very difficult and very wonderful, but you have to deal with the difficult in order to access the wonderful. Doors, doors, open or closed. God's door, what does it say? Always open. Well, and then dreams and visions still matter. Not just dreams of any old kind, but dreams and visions. I have a dream, said Martin Luther King. When I was a young minister, I had a dream. I was called to preach. Some of you all know about that. Had this terrible experience. Went off to a youth camp with my girlfriend. Got converted and called to preach at the same time. It was terrible. And uh, when I got back, I didn't want to tell anybody about it because I was feeling different on the inside. Mine wasn't one of these double whammies. Mine was one of these quiet things where you all of a sudden begin to know what you're supposed to do with yourself. Um, I wanted to be everything but what God called me to be. But anyway, so I didn't tell anybody for a long time. And people would start saying strange things like, what happened to you? And I would say, what do you mean? And I would try to, this is terrible, but I would try to be more profane than usual, you know, to prove to them how bad I was, <laughs> you know. But it just didn't work. And finally, I said to one of my very dear friends, I said, I accepted Christ as my Savior. I don't know everything it means, but I know some things. If you're out there and you've been waiting to accept Christ because you don't know everything it means, get real. All you can do is accept as much as you understand in relationship to as much as you allow, you're willing to allow in. God can take it from there, you know. But you know what the biggie was? You know what the tough one was? To go to tell my daddy that I was going to go into the ministry now. For those of you visiting, my daddy was a big-time entertainer. He was a nightclub guy. He was a wonderful man, and I thank God for him. But he had some real ambitions for me. My dad didn't have much education, and he didn't do a lot with regard to what's good with the world, you know. So I said, Daddy, I need to talk to you. It's about what I want to do with my life. And he said, good, let's talk about that. I've been wanting to talk about that. I said, Dad, I'm going into the ministry. I never had said that out loud. I had tried not to say that to anybody. And he said, what? And I said, I'm going into the ministry. And he looked at me and he said, my God, son, there's no future in that. <laughs> it wasn't too very long after that that I preached my first sermon. And this is pretty gross, but I asked them not to come. I said, I just don't want you to come in and sit there because if you're sitting right there when I start preaching, and I look out there, it's just going to make me real nervous. And I don't want to hurt your feelings, but uh, will you just promise me that you won't come into the church and, um, when I preach my first sermon? And they said, yeah. So I was preaching on friendship, the keystone of the Christian church. And I looked over to the, this, this side, and the window was open, and there was my mom and daddy standing out. <laughs> you know, out in the yard, the, the church had opened the window up a little bit so they could hear whatever poor thing it was that I said. Um, and so after it was all over, I went out and I said, you could have come in. And they said, but you asked us not to. And I said, I know, but you, you, you could have come in, you know. Anyway, yes, it was a pretty full day. We built at the Habitat house for about an hour, an hour and a half. They built for about an hour and a half. I had to leave to get ready for Hannah Meadows' memorial service, which was at St. Matthew's Church. Hannah Meadows and her husband, Bishop Jack Meadows, came to this church. Um, she was at this altar for a prayer for healing. She wanted to be anointed, and some of you are here. Do you know that the only six months, this is a God thing, but the only six months that that cancer did not show any change, neither worse nor better, but it didn't grow, was the six months after she knelt at this altar. The service was very moving, and as we experienced the worship service, there were several things that were important. Let me tell you one. Our Bishop Ken Carter did better than he knew how. 
if he happened to be visiting this morning, I would have to say that, because when I went up to him afterwards, I said, that wasn't as the scribes and Pharisees. You know that scripture that says he spoke as one having authority? Of course, he always speaks with authority, but let me tell you what he said. Listen to this. You need this. I need this. We need this. He said, you want to be successful in life? I want to be successful in life, too. I'm going to do you a favor, and I'm going to tell you how to be successful in life. There's only one way. And the only way to be successful in life is to know the right people. And if you don't know the right people and you don't associate with the right people, let me tell you, you will not ever be successful. And you know who the right people are, don't you? And he said, so did Hannah know who the right people were. The children and the poor and the outcast and the persons who had no place to call home. She knew the right people. You and I have opportunity to know the right people too. And that is not to put down or to diminish people with status and power, but it is to instruct all of us, whether we are little or big people in the world, to remember that the kingdom of God consists of those that belong to God and acknowledge God as Lord. And it doesn't make a bit of difference whether we're big time or little time because when you're in that relationship, everybody is the child of God according to what God had in mind. That meant a lot. We got a little reception line after it was over. And Bishop and his son, oh, the son did a beautiful job. His, nun, his name was Mark. Incidentally, his daddy was sitting out there and he said, I just have to tell you this one thing. He was saying this through his tears. He said, we were raised in a pretty religious household. You know, everybody thought that was kind of funny, bishop, wife, family. And he said, but I also need to tell you that most of it came from mama. <laughs> and I thought that that was kind of interesting. And the bishop shook his head, yeah. Anyway, they were all in the line, and I was kind of standing off to the side. I had gone through the line, and I was drinking some apple juice, and a girl came up to me, and my first thought was, you know, this is funny. This lady looks like um, Hannah like the lady whose service we'd come to. And she said, are you Keith? And I said, yeah. She said, from Wells? I said, yeah. She said, do you remember me? Now, what do you say? <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, hon. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you know, I'm Hannah's daughter. And she said, we were at the church several times, but we were at the church that Sunday y'all had the special prayer. I say this with the most humility I know how to work up. She said, you know what mom told me not long before she passed? I said, what? She said, if I had to do it all over again, I'd join Wells. Not this Wells. Maybe she meant that. But if I know Hannah's heart, I think she meant any Wells or any church that said our door is open and our dreams are alive and our visions continue. And we're not going to give up. And we're not going to say that peace on earth, goodwill toward men is a complete impossibility and will never come to pass. And we're not going to say for a single minute that God did not love the world, that he gave his only begotten son, but we're going to say that God did love the world, does love the world, keeps giving God's self to us in the spirit of Christ. And we're not going to give up the vision that says one day, somehow, before it's over and done, all of us will have an opportunity to stand in the presence of God and to hear God say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Doors and visions and dreams. Postscript, read the scriptures through and almost every significant book has a dream of some kind. But you remember Revelations 21? What a dream. The day will come when there will be no more tears and no more sorrow and no more wars and no more rumors of war. For God will be in our midst. And at last, the dream will be reality. Oh, God, make it so. And use the broken stuff of us to contribute toward that end. Amen. Now let's pray.
Our Father, the scriptures are very much alive in us today, and your spirit is very close to bless. And as we come to the closing moments of our time, let each one of us in our own way refresh our commitment to you and open our hearts to receive not just your spirit, but to ask you to come into the everyday, common, ordinary stuff of our living and keep our dreams going and our visions alive. And until we have no breath whatsoever, O oh God, help us dream the dream and help us work the kingdom as a response to your grace and concern for us. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.